Let me welcome you all to this uh, session, which is on cooperation to improve environmental governance and implementation. And um, the purpose of this session is to create an interaction among the panelists and also among the panel and the audience. And uh, please note that the audience is being recorded, so the World Justice Project will use this recording in their further work but otherwise uh, references are not made to what different uh, speakers say. Now, I'm privileged to moderate this panel. I'm, my name is Hans Corell, former legal counsel of the United Nations. And on the panel, I have four panelists who in their different capacities have a tremendous experience in the field that we are going to address. First of all, it's just, uh, Justice Antonio Benjamin in Brazil, who is here on my right-hand side, left-hand side from your perspective. And then I have Lord Robert Carnworth, who is the Justice of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. And then on my, my left hand side I have Scott Fulton, a former General Counsel of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And last but not least on the far end here, Donald Caniaro, a former UN colleague who is the Chairman of the Environmental Tribunal of Kenya. And we've discussed amongst ourselves in what order I should put questions to the panelists. And we've come to the conclusion that we will first hear uh, Antonio Benjamin and then uh, Donald Caniaro, followed by Lord Carnwath and Scott Fulton. So let me, uh, without further ado, introduce Antonio Herman Benjamin. Uh, he is uh, a justice in the National High Court of Brazil since 2006, and is also chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law. Prior to his appointment as justice, he served as a senior assistant attorney general of the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil, where he had, was the head of both the consumer and environmental protection divisions. And then Justice Benjamin received an LLB from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and an LLM from the University of Illinois a College of Law and a PhD from the Federal University of Rio Grande del Sol and is also professor of law at the Catholic University of Brasilia and has been a visiting professor at the University of Texas Law School in Austin for 17 years and he has lectured in many countries. Now, Justice Benjamin, the question I'd like to put to you is can the environment be protected by the judiciary and especially in the areas like deforestation of tropical forests, which of course is a major issue in your country. Justice Benjamin, do you have a question? Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Corral. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to, um, to be here today and uh, see again uh, many of the old friends um, and also uh, meet uh, new people, new, uh, new colleagues. Uh, to answer your question, I would uh, start saying that uh, there are two misconceptions about us judges, uh, and that you only realize when you become one. Uh, first is that if you are an expert in a particular area, like environmental law, you tend to believe that you become a judge and that you uh, be able to do much more than you have been doing in your uh, career um, as an environmental uh, lawyer, an environmental public prosecutor, uh, and so on. And in fact, we have a, uh, a much broader dimension of cases, and um, uh, once in a while an environmental case um, uh, comes uh, to us. Of course, this doesn't apply to specialized environmental courts, and I, I see here uh, two esteemed colleagues that are are uh, um, members of those courts, uh, um, uh, Judge Coniaro and, and Judge um, uh, Brian Preston. Uh, but in, in our case, uh, we, uh, uh, at the national level, we, uh, we have many more things than, than, uh, and, and issues than, uh, than the environment. So this is a surprise in a way for uh, people that come uh, straight from uh, a particular area uh, of law. The second aspect that I would like to, um, um, uh, to mention briefly in responding to, you, uh, to your question is that uh, we quite often tend to forget that uh, uh, in order to protect the environment, we need uh, the rule of law. 
we, we come from our little universe, our little canton, and we think that if we uh, convince Congress to pass um, enough environmental legislation and, um, uh, and we encourage some NGOs to, uh, uh, to be established, that you know, the environment will be in very, uh, in very good hands. But it's much more complicated than that, and that's the, one of the reasons why I'm so pleased to be in a conference in which the background discussion that unites everything is, is the rule of law. And here, perhaps, um, uh, one, one uh, little thought on the rule of law, that in, in comparing uh, the terms in Latin language and in English, uh, in, in English, you say the rule of law, and the plural would not mean what the singular does. The, it's not the rule of laws, because you, the focus on the uh, expression in English is on the conveyor. It's law. But in Latin language, the word, the expression, is in French, état de droit, Estado de Derecho in Espanol, and um, Estado de Direito in, in Portuguese. And here, what really conveys the meaning is the plural, because the focus is on rights. Uh, and the more rights you have recognized and fully recognized, the better. In respect to the environment, I think uh, we, uh, we are permanently in, um, uh, in uh, facing this conflict, laws versus rights. And um, uh, it is a misconception, and that's the, 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 the second one that I wanted to, to mention to you, uh, to think that because you enacted environmental legislation, so you have plenty of laws, that those laws uh, will um, uh, eventually deliver what they are supposed to do. Now, directly uh, answering to, uh, uh, to your question, we judges have to realize, first of all, that we are a last resort. We will not be able to solve all environmental problems that the globe, uh, that our region, or even our little county uh, face. So, uh, it is, uh, uh, that said, on the other hand, uh, it is uh, also equally important to realize that we judges do have a strong role to play in protecting the environment. So we should not take uh, um, uh, any of those two extreme views, one thinking that we judges, if, especially if we are uh, very conscious ab about the, 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 the tragedy of the commons of our planet that we are going to solve all environmental problems come to us or on the opposite direction that because we can't do it uh, and that's something that is mainly within the administration or civil society that uh, we, um, uh, we should just um, uh, have a hands, hands off uh, attitude. My final comment, and I'm, I'm saving some precious minutes here, and I, I hope you keep this in mind later on. Uh, my, my, my final uh, thought has to do with the, much, uh, with the broader picture. And so I'm coming back to the, my, my very first remarks. There is no, no, no reason really, really to believe that the environment will be much better if we have judges who are not independent, if we have judges that are surrounded by corruption, either corruption in the judiciary or corruption in, in those agencies that are supposed to grant the permits or even to provide the expertise uh, to, uh, to the judiciary. So um, it is a much more um, a complex answer than I, uh, I would hope to, uh, to give you. And um, uh, later on, I, I'm saving my minutes uh, to discuss in more detail the issue of deforestation. Because here we have a whole set of other uh, components that uh, make uh, things much more complicated for us judges. 
Thank you very much. Well, I mean, there's newcomers here. I would like to say that we have agreed that speakers have between six and ten minutes, and then they will interact among themselves, and then we will invite the audience because that's a very important part of our uh, afternoon session here. So you will come back to the deforestation issue that I raised with you. Yes. Thank you very much. And just to uh, yeah. remind you, I spoke sev for seven minutes. Yes. Thank you. Very good. You've been a very <laughs> disciplined. <laughs> Yes. So um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Donald Canero, as I said, a former UN colleague. He's chairman of the National Environmental Tribunal of Kenya since 2005, and he's also representative of the International Council for Environmental Law to the United Nations in Nairobi, where he resides. Previously, he served as a diplomat with the Kenyan government and in various capacities with the UN Environmental Program, UNEP, which, as you know, is based in Nairobi. And this was until his retirement in 2003. And in that year, he founded the law firm Caniaro and Caniaro Advocates, of which he is the managing partner. And over the years, uh, Mr. Caniaro has focused on environmental law and policy, having participated in the preparatory processes of the UN Conference on the Human uh, environment in Stockholm, 1972, which I vividly recall because I joined the Ministry of Justice that year, so I saw it from my windows in the Ministry of Justice. And then he participated in the preparation of the first Rio UN Conference on Sustainable Development in 1992, and the Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg in 2002, and then in the UNEP Governing Councils, and this is governance and environmental work from its inception in 1973. Now, Ms. Canero, against your background here, the question I would like to put to you is, what challenges do you face in the work of the National Environmental Tribunal of Kenya, a national environmental court? Is the court accepted as an instrument for governance and enforcement? And do you see its work as expanding or shrinking? Could you briefly explain uh, using examples, if you can? You have the floor. Okay. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Ambassador, for your general, generous uh, introduction and I thank you all uh, here and appreciate uh, uh, having friends, many friends on this side and on that side. It's a pleasure to be in si on such a panel. I think before I respond to the uh, questions you have put to me, uh, I would like to uh, briefly uh, let you know what uh, the National Environment Tribunal uh, is. First, um, it uh, was established, it's a young institution, it's 12 years old, the first chair of the tribunal was there for three years, and I am on my ninth year as chair of the tribunal. So it's uh, relatively young. It's constituted by a statute, Environmental Management and Coordination Act, number eight of 1999, and it came into force uh, on uh, 14th January 2000. This uh, tribunal comprises a chairman, uh, five uh, and four members. Uh, it operates at national and uh, county levels uh, so that um, uh, a case filed uh, in the tribunal is mentioned in Nairobi, its headquarters, and uh, during the uh, hearing of the tribunal we make a visit to the region to make sure we understand the full implications of what's on the ground and whether it corresponds uh, with the uh, 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 pleadings that are filed before us. The chairman, by the way, is uh, appointed, is nominated by the Judicial Service Commission and must be a person who qualifies to be a judge of the High Court of Kenya. And uh, the next uh, advocate, lawyer, is uh, named, nominated by the Law Society of Kenya, not by the government. And thereafter, there is another uh, uh, lawyer qualified in environmental law from the academia, and uh, that's nominated by the minister uh, or cabinet secretary in charge of the environment, and two others uh, who have demonstrated exemplary performance in the management of the environment. So this uh, is the set that uh, uh, handles those issues. The quorum is the chairman and any two uh, other members. 
the uh, next point that I would like to make is that to file a case before the tribunal, you, do, you don't have to demonstrate any interest or injury, and there is no fee attached to it so that access uh, is as open as it can be. The jurisdiction, which is appellate, we don't have original jurisdiction, it's appellate jurisdiction, uh, is uh, 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 spelled out in the act that I did and is also donated by another act of parliament, uh, the Forest Act of 2005. I might say at the outset that many other bills that are in the making do, uh, uh, do also uh, provide for this possibility. So I think it's a very important process so that environment is uh, approached in an integrated fashion. The uh, question of uh, is who is it that would uh, be able to approach the tribunal? And these are the parties concerned uh, who want a decision to be made, whether it's env on environmental impact assessment by NEMA, N National Environment Management Authority, that regulates this set of activities throughout the country and at, even at the local level. So NEMA is an important institution to the extent is it is fully engaged in the field of the environment, is overseeing it correctly and rightly and intervening on a timely basis, then the tribunal is assured of a set of activities because it is a challenge of the decision or non-decision by NEMA that is appealed to the tribunal. And it, NEMA has a string of other responsible institutions, committees, uh, co uh, committees, subcommittees, standards committee, uh, and uh, the director general himself as an institution and his officers and a set of other committees. So those decisions are the ones that are brought uh, to us. And an appeal from our ruling then goes uh, in the old days to the High Court uh, of, of, of Kenya also the judicial review aspects would go to the High Court of Kenya. But there has been a change in the laws of Kenya drastically in the last three years since a new constitution came in place. Now, the, uh, this drastic change has involved at the superior court level from previously to the High Court and the Court of Appeal to five. A court above the Court of Appeal, which is the Supreme Court, the Court of, of, of Seven Judges, including the Chief Justice, the Court of Appeal, which has expanded from 11 to 30, and at the High Court level, there is the High Court with two other courts that have been established at the same level as the High Court. That is the Environment and Land Court, and the uh, re labor relations uh, 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 court. Now, our concern here is the environment and land court. And that has already on the board, it was desired within the first year, 16 judges. In my view, this number is not adequate. And when we were preparing the statute, Act Number no. uh, 19 of 2011, I thought uh, that a minimum of maybe 70 judges would be more like it because the jurisdiction of the court is on environmental matters and the land use and title to land. And land is basically life in Kenya. So it's very important. It has a background that uh, is extremely challenging and therefore a few judges will just bring disrepute to a new court that is not fully uh, established. So our appeals then go to this particular court environment and land court and is extremely important. As I was involved, you might have asked me, uh, uh, okay, you might have asked me how come there is uh, 
uh, this tribunal and uh, you didn't uh, just have yourselves promoted to the, uh, the, the, the higher court. We didn't do so because I think a specialized institution such as our tribunal would be extremely important. You asked, and quite rightly, what challenges we yes. do face. And, sure. this, and these are many, and uh, as time is running out, I'll mention quickly uh, 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 just uh, the, the key ones. Yes, the uh, uh, representation uh, is, of course, parties and mainly the respondents, the NEMA and uh, the proponent, the one, uh, a developer, are represented by counsel as al is allowed. Very few appellants uh, have no counsel. What, uh, a, a few of them have no counsel whatsoever. And as access, anyone can actually appeal a decision. It's very important that uh, we take care while listening to these issues uh, for those who are not represented at all or have chosen a person to represent them who is not a lawyer. The handicap. So anyone can appeal? Yes, anyone. Anyone, because that's, that's important. Environment has to be mm. protected by all, not only by some. Because some uh, may even uh, purport to jive by justice. Uh, I remember early in uh, my uh, role as the chairman, somebody appealing, coming to my office, wanted to see the chairman. And I told my secretary, wait until there are about 10 people there. And where there are, let me know. There were, I was told, I came out, opened the, the door so quietly, and he said, who wants to see the chairman? And there were, so I told somebody, well, you cannot see the chairman if you want to see him. You have a matter before us. Come with the other lawyers and or the other parties, or wait until there, there is a full session and you can raise the matter there. Nobody ever again thereafter wanted to have a discussion with the, <laughs> with, with the chairman because they yeah. knew the situation is completely different. Yeah. Then I want to mention another extremely important uh, uh, area, a uh, challenge, and that is the, 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 the finances to be able to promote awareness uh, on environment more so now that the country is not only unified at the national level, but you have 47 units having expanded from eight. And therefore, unless we overextend to inform mm. the public, only the de more developed parts mm. will then have easy access uh, to the tribunal. And right. that would not be right or even proper mm -hmm. because you would need to get out there. Yeah. And Thank you. Uh, what, what I think would be interesting in the exchange, yes. interchange here, that maybe uh, Justice Benjamin and you could make a comparison and, yeah. and see whether there's anything that you can draw by, by way of conclusions yes. from your work. Okay. So if we then should continue, thank you very much for your contribution. We discussed then uh, the uh, order uh, uh, here and we thought that it was best to hear uh, Lord Carnworth uh, as the third speaker on our panel, uh, and I will explain why. First of all, uh, Lord Robert Carnworth is a uh, commander of the Order of Victoria, which is an, a distinct, uh, uh, shall we say, remark um, by uh, his country. He's a justice of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, as I said, which I think is a new arrangement, isn't it, uh, in, under your constitution, which is not written, uh, I understand. And in a 40-year career as advocate and judge, covering many areas of the law, he is taking a particular interest in land and environmental law. Among other offices, he has served as Attorney General to the uh, Royal Highness Prince of Wales and Chairman of the Law Commission and Senior President of Tribunals. In 2003, he joined the UNEP Judicial Task Force set up following the Johannesburg Global Symposium of Judges, and he was a founding member of the European Union Forum of Judges for the Environment, and he has recently become a member of the UNEP International Advisory Council on Environmental Justice. The logic here is that we go from the national level now to international cooperation, and we will hear judges uh, who have experience from this, both from the national level and the international cooperation. 
The question that I would like to put to Lord uh, Cranworth is, in 2002, the Global Judges Symposium in Johannesburg affirmed the central role of the judiciary in the implementation and development of environmental law. How much progress has been made since then in furthering the objectives of the symposium and what should be UNEP's role in that process? And I'm particularly glad to be able to put this question to you because I had the privilege of being present in Johannesburg in my then capacity as legal counsel of the United Nations. And it was extremely interesting to listen to them. And of course, the host judge there was Arthur Chaskelson, who unfortunately you know, is no longer with us. Lord Conworth, please. Right, I've got my timekeeper on my right, so all is in order. I, I'm delighted to be here. I'm slightly false pretenses because I'm not a, an envi a specialist environmental judge. Uh, we don't really have specialist judges in England. We don't have a specialist court. On the other hand, I've taken an interest in environmental law all my working life. And as Hans has said, I, um, I came in actually, uh, I wasn't at Johannesburg, but I, um, I was appointed after Johannesburg by our then Chief Justice Lord Wolfe to um, join the task force which was set up by UNEP under the chairmanship of Arthur Chaskelson indeed who was a great great leader and a great visionary in the law and so I was then involved as indeed was Scott Fulton in the sort of process of trying to bring some um, flesh as it were to the skeleton provided by the symposium uh, I mean, one of the things that sort of struck me first, well, what we, what, you know, why judges? There's this great ringing declaration that judges are central to the whole thing, but um, we don't have a democratic mandate. We're not, you know, we're there to sort of, we're really technicians enforcing the law. But it did occur to me as I sort of w went through those discussions that we actually have a rather more significant role. I mean, there are two things, really. One is stability. Um, I mean, judges, uh, politicians come and go. Um, as do mobile phones, but the um, <laughs> judges, judges on the whole are more, have more continuity. I, one thing I was sort of remembering early on in this process, uh, quite an important project, which again Scott was involved in, was producing a, um, a judicial manual on environmental law. It's still available. It's actually quite a judicial handbook on environmental law. The idea was trying to set down sort of general principles of environmental law which were common to um, really worldwide effectively what might call a sort of common law of the environment and we had a panel of judges working with two very distinguished academics um, and I co-chaired it with Judge Weira Mantri who some of you may know who was a very distinguished judge of the International Court of Justice um, and he writes a marvellous foreword which echoes some of the sentiments that it came into his great judgment in the Hungarian Dams case about the relationship between modern environmental law with historic um, traditions. But I remember first meeting him in London in, uh, it must have been about February 2003, after we had had our meeting in uh, Nairobi, the first meeting of the group. And I hadn't met him before, but I knew him by reputation. Now it just so happened that he arrived in London um, not so much to see me, but actually to talk to the opposition about the advice that had just been given to Tony Blair by his Attorney General about the legality of the Iraq war. Now you may remember there was a very controversial time when um, advice had to be sought as whether under international law it was lawful for us to launch uh, a, uh, an army into Iraq. And rather to many people's surprise, our Attorney General said it was. And Judge Weir Ementri was, uh, was actually, he was very, very shocked. He was someone who sort of took a very personal view of international law. And he was rather shocked to find what he thought just didn't fit into his conception of environment, of international law. And so that was the sort of background in which I found myself discussing these rather more <laughs> mundane issues of the, of the environment. But uh, I was only saying that there we are. I mean, Tony Blair, you may remember him. He's come and gone. I'm still here. So <laughs> in a sense, uh, one has a sort of responsibility, I think, as judges to carry forward these ideas. I think the other thing that, uh, that I learned from that is the way that judges, I mean, we're very conservative by nature. We don't like doing anything new. But once someone's done something new, then we don't mind sort of carrying on with it. 
And one of the great ideas, I think, behind the, the, the forum and the, the collaboration developed was for us to exchange ideas. And I became aware for the first time of the extraordinary creative work done by, in particular, by the Supreme Court of India uh, in developing the sort of constitutional principles of the right to life and extending that into protection of the environment. And those were sort of carried on in other, well, we said Pakistan, Nepal, we heard this morning. But also the Philippines, I mean, extraordinary work done by in the Philippines. And so one became aware that actually around the world there were a lot of interesting ideas going on and being developed judicially. So not just a sort of funny ideas, but actually being given a judicial framework, a judicial context. And of course, once you know that, once you realize that another judge has done something, then you feel much more comfortable about it. And this works in, 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 not only in the way of actually providing a pre precedent for judicial acti activity, but it also, I think, feeds into the um, thinking of the legislators. So, um, and one's certainly seen that in the Philippines, where they've developed their environmental courts, new forms of writ and so on, for protecting the environment. And of course, in India, we now have uh, green courts developed under statutes. And I'm sure there are plenty of examples of this, where in a sort of quiet way, judges have sort of led the thinking, which has then fed, it, fed into the um, wider framework. So I must say, when I went in 2000, we'll talk about this a bit more, and I think Miss Scott may, but last year we had a, in Rio, we had a conference on judicial governance. And I was very keen, that stage, to be positive, because I think there was a tendency to think that nothing had happened. But actually, in a quiet way, all sorts of things have been happening. And um, I mean, to mention two very important ones, the, the development of green tribunals, environmental tribunals, around the world. I mean, it's extraordinary the number of jurisdictions now around the world which have developed specialist tribunals, specialist courts, which are actually on, in, in a very practical day-to-day -day work um, uh, enforcing and developing environmental justice. And the other thing allied to that, I think, is the um, access to justice, the, the Aarhus principles, which were uh, started life as a European convention. Um, have gradually sort of developed their own jurisprudence, developed their own strength, have been applied generally. Um, and I, I think, you know, whether that's UNEP's work, I don't know, but I think what is very important was the, the stimulus UNEP's work gave then the task force at Hannesby Conference to people having the confidence to, to spread these out ideas more widely. I mean, just to take one example from my own experience, we, in Europe, we set up a body called the European Union Forum of Judges for the Environment, which was, that followed the stimulus of UNEP. Very good forum for the exchange of ideas judicially, but also for helping some of the, uh, the countries, the Eastern European countries coming out of the, uh, the communist era. So that I found myself, for example, in Kiev, chairing a judicial seminar for judges from countries like, well, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, um, Belarus, where we were discussing the implementation of Aarhus principles in their own different countries. Um, and there have been many initiatives of this sort going on around the world. And I think, uh, I, I think I've probably said what I want to say by way of introduction. I think as to where we go from here, the second part of your question, I think we might leave it until we've actually heard Scott, and then we might discuss that. But I think a very important issue for us is to think, well, how can we actually build on these successes and use the power of UNEP um, to, to do so? Thank you so much. Um, well, this brings now uh, the logic into the way we discussed how speakers would take the floor here. Um, I'm now going to give the floor for Scott Fulton. He has over three decades of high-level government experience in the environmental protection area. Most recently, he has served as general counsel of the US Environmental Protection Agency, having been appointed to that position by President Obama. Other appointments and designations of note include environmental appeals judge and head of the Environmental Protection Agency's international program. 
and he has for over 20 years been actively involved in international environmental governance efforts, working closely with multilateral organizations such as the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, that you have heard references to many times already here. Also the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, and the World Conservation Union, as well as bilaterally with China and many other countries. He is now a visiting scholar with the Environmental Law Institute, teaching law and working with private sector clients on domestic and international issues as a partner with the Beverage and Diamond Environmental Law firm in Washington, D.C. Now, questions to Scott Fulton based on his previous experience are the following. You've been involved in the UNEP's environmental governance work since its inception. Can you describe the linkage between environmental governance and rule of law? And also, where does the non-traditional or private governance fit with this conversation? And I might have follow-up questions here relating to Africa in particular. Scott, okay. you have the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, and uh, thanks also to the World Justice Project for the invitation to continue to be part of what uh, I consider to be one of the most needed and promising initiatives of our time. Um, I've had, uh, as indicated, the opportunity to work on environmental governance issues, uh, including um, uh, the chance to, to work closely with, uh, with all of the, the folks uh, with whom I share the podium here, uh, and also Judge Brian Preston from the uh, Environment Court from New South Wales, Australia. Um, and uh, it's really been one of the great um, uh, opportunities of, of my professional life, I would say. Uh, I've also had a chance to uh, be involved in the World Justice Project's work um, for a little over three years now. Um, and I've been watching um, the directions that both of these undertakings uh, have been uh, moving in uh, and considering uh, where they might intersect. Uh, and that's what I thought I might talk about a little bit here. Uh, in our arena, in the environmental arena, um, we add an additional phrase uh, to our nomenclature about rule of law that probably needs to be considered in relation to rule of law, and that's environmental governance. Uh, these are very closely related concepts, but understanding their intersection I think is quite important in terms of being able to move forward uh, in a thoughtful and deliberate way uh, to building environmental rule of law. Um, Law, as, uh, as we all know, um, can exist in form only um, or it can exist in practice. Um, and uh, that's the idea that the concept of rule of law uh, tries to get at. The rule of law um, is when the law itself has been substantially actualized um, in practice. Uh, when the, when the, the law moves from um, words on paper um, to reality, uh, when it prevails, if you will. Uh, or as, uh, as uh, Justice Kennedy said the other day, the rule of law is present when the law exists in the, in the consciousness of the people. Um, when uh, the rule of law, when the law is not followed or not honored or doesn't exist in the consciousness of the people, uh, there can be said to be um, a rule of law gap. Um, the, uh, the, law, the rule of law has not yet fully arrived. And the concept of governance um, is really about the, the mechanisms that need to be in place and in practice in order to bridge the rule of law gap, um, to, to, uh, to move from form uh, to substance. Um, and a lot of the work that's been done within the uh, United Nations Environment Program context uh, has centered around what those things are that need to be present. And I think they're fundamentally important in their own right, but they're also fundamentally important in advancing the environmental rule of law. Um, as uh, Lord Carnweth said, uh, we've been uh, chipping away at this for, uh, for over a decade now uh, in the UN context. Um, uh, what I wanted to suggest to you is that uh, there was a substantial um, 
step forward um, that appeared last year at the Rio Plus 20 proceedings in Brazil. Um, a couple of things occurred there of moment. One was uh, the very clear recognition by the world community um, that uh, our primary challenge in the environmental arena at this moment is not so much the absence of environmental law, that thanks to the advent of multilateral environmental agreements and model national environmental legislation that had been taken up in most countries around the world, um, having law on the books is no longer so much the problem, but a huge problem exists in the implementation of that law and the rule of law gap, if you will, in the environmental context. Uh, one of the more important events that took place in Brazil was the World Congress on Law, Justice, and Governance for Environmental Sustainability. Um, Lord Carnworth mentioned this before. This was an interesting coming together of, uh, of judges, uh, attorneys general, and auditors general around the world uh, to, uh, to talk about where we were at this moment in time with respect to environmental rule of law, essentially. Um, there was an instrument that came out of that meeting that I commend to your attention, which is the Rio Plus 20 Declaration. Uh, includes a, a very important expression, I think, by that important community of interest um, about where the gaps are at this point uh, on, in environmental rule of law and environmental governance. Um, that declaration was carried forward um, to the United Nations Environment Program's Governing Council meeting this past winter. And in February, the Governing Council, uh, which now um, uh, includes universal membership, uh, and therefore, um, uh, when it expresses itself, it's really speaking on behalf of the, of the nation states of this world, issued a, uh, a Governing Council decision uh, that likewise includes a very important expression on, uh, on what's needed in order to achieve, achieve environmental uh, rule of law. And uh, uh, I'll just quickly tick off the elements of that but also commend that Governing Council decision uh, to you for your attention. Um, uh, the Governing Council identified um, a number of mutually supporting governance features, including uh, implementable and enforceable laws. And the, the emphasis here is not so much on the substance of the law, but its procedural strength. Uh, second, um, Disclo disclosure of environmental information to the public must be present. Uh, public participation in environmental decision making. Uh, the environmental decision making both by public entities and private entities, fundamentally important. True accountability, absolutely essential for both public and private environmental decision makers, including the presence of, uh, of real on-the-ground enforcement, criminal, civil, administrative enforcement. Um, coordination of roles within government, a small but in incredibly important consideration. There needs to be institutional coherence in how government approaches this body of work in order to be efficient and effective. Um, environmental <coughs> auditing and other oversight mechanisms that ensure program integrity um, in environmental protection work, must be present. And finally, uh, but uh, no less important, timely, impartial, and independent dispute resolution, principally through the courts. Um, important to emphasize the, um, the, um, the interconnectedness of these ideas. Uh, <coughs> uh, they, they are mutually reinforcing and interdependent in a very, to a very significant degree, such that attention needs to be brought to each and every one of them in order to have a shot at sustained success uh, with environmental protection and to have a shot at building the environmental rule of law. Um, uh, so our hope is that this will substantially animate uh, the work of the environmental, um, uh, United Nations Environment Program um, and other partners in this space. And uh, I think it's also our shared sense that those other partners should include the World Justice Project. Uh, the intersections between what UNEP's doing and what the World Justice Project is doing um, become increasingly clear. Just a couple of examples. 
One is this articulation that I just shared with you um, about the elements of governance that need to be in place to build environmental rule of law seem to me to be highly relevant if the, uh, to the World Justice Project's efforts to develop metrics for measuring environmental rule of law. Um, and so one of our hopes is that uh, there would be some, uh, some sharing across uh, the institutions here to that effect. For UNAP's purposes, uh, I, uh, the, the, the World Justice Project's uh, uh, rule of law index <coughs> Uh, ought to be playing a role in the prioritization of interventions uh, on the environment. Um, and, uh, and it also uh, will, over time, I think, provide value as a performance measure on the efficacy of those interventions. So um, just, to, just to start in our thinking about uh, where these two bodies of work are, where they intersect, um, in hopes that we might be able to proceed with uh, uh, deliberate speed in building uh, the, the kind of bridge between these efforts. Thank you very much, and thank you for reminding us of the Rio Plus 20 declaration. Uh, several of us were present when that was elaborated, and I'm so happy to see the decision you refer to by the Governing Council of UNEP. And I think in one of the key elements of the decision, there are 15 references to the rule of law. So really, this has become an important element. Now, the idea is that we should have an interchange among the panelists before I give the floor to the audience. Um, one element that I would like to leave with you when I give you the floor now again is the, the uh, influence of science uh, on the work of the court. When I was a young judge uh, in 1973, I served for a year on the Swedish Water Court of Appeal. And it was a tremendous learning experience for a young uh, judge then to, to understand how much science meant when you went about to adjudicate the cases because it was based on science. I was asked also to bring in the Arctic in this discussion because they know that I've been working on the Arctic matters, but I don't want Want to take up time with that, but those interested are welcome to visit my web page where there are references to the Arctic Governance um, uh, Project, and there there are, is this distinct reference also to the importance of science. So, if you would like to keep that in mind, in a particular when you look at your issue on the on the um, um, forests and so forth. So, I leave the floor open. You may wish to comment on each other's contributions, and please. Uh, so, on. On the issue of deforestation, I, uh, which I think can uh, well illustrate the potential, but at the same time the limitations of the judiciary. Uh, as, as we all know, um, um, environmental law in, in, in most countries has uh, two um, broad areas, one pollution control and the other one in, in the conservation of nature. I um, spent most of my life dealing with conservation uh, uh, of nature, but of course working uh, with uh, pollution issues uh, as well. And what strikes me as a judge when I, uh, in my court, I hear appeals from the state supreme courts and also from the federal court of appeals is that quite often we see uh, a few differences in, in the way those cases are litigated. And they have also to do uh, with the component that we, we want us to discuss, which is science. Uh, in, in, uh, in respect to the conservation of nature, quite often uh, the level of scientific expertise that is required is not very high. Basically, e, uh, uh, most national uh, environmental laws protect either specific biomes or specific areas within biomes. And it's just a matter of seeing whether the, um, uh, the requirements of the laws are being, uh, being followed. And the, um, the, the, the technology there has, uh, in this area has reached a level in which by satellite uh, you can uh, identify uh, an area that has been, has been cleared, um, uh, an area that is less than 10 meters, square meters, 
uh, as opposed when I uh, started uh, uh, working with deforestation issues, in which, first of all, those pictures were very, very expensive. They could cost $50,000. $50, and the area that um, um, they were not very good, they could not see very well, especially in, 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 in regions that were uh, covered um, as the Amazon or tropical forests in general by, uh, by, by clouds. So basically, as a judge, uh, the technical issues there are not uh, as uh, complex as, for example, a contamination uh, by uh, water uh, or drinking water with lead, which is um, uh, it's a, a very recent case that we had in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in my court. Uh, so this is uh, the first uh, comparison that I would like to make between the two areas using uh, the new component uh, that um, uh, you mentioned. Of course, when, um, if, even in the conservation area, uh, if you really want to protect um, the broad spectrum of the environment and you want to reach the level, not just the level of uh, ecosystems or species, but the genetic diversity, then you might find um, uh, a very um, a difficult technical uh, and technological issues. But um, m uh, I would say that most cases, uh, the, uh, the great majority of cases that we as judges uh, face, at least in, in, in my country, in the green area, are not very sophisticated. Or they do not require a very sophisticated um, uh, uh, approach. So. Um, that's it in terms of uh, science, uh, and then uh, I'm still saving my deforestation uh, three minutes for later. <laughs> well, but that, that was very, very interesting. I mean, the, the distinction here, when you can use satellite and, and, and see what the effects are, but which is different from what is water pollution and so forth. you can use Google yeah. now. Well, Google even, <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, Donald Caniara, do you recognize yourself in this description? What are the main features of your cases before your court in, in uh, Kenya? Well, uh, <coughs> Chair, the uh, environment and, and science are really integrated. If you look at the development in an uh, environmental law, it's really more science moving hand in hand with the policy. And that's what you have in the area of chemicals. Ozone uh, protection, the ozone, the, uh, the, the transportation of hazardous wastes, and the regulations on hazardous waste, which I do find in my tribunal invoked many, many times. The question of noise, that again is a factor uh, quite uh, abundantly in that. So is pollution. And so the, if you have to apply effectively the precautionary principle, then the, or the science as a base of saying, uh, do we have adequate information scientifically and otherwise to uh, invoke the precautionary principle. This, again, comes in and we do actually uh, you to invoke it quite, quite a lot because the real principles as a whole are part of the law of Kenya mm -hmm. and part the latest, our latest constitution, sustainable development, is a key principle uh, which is part of the law of Kenya and must be invoked. So as you compare uh, the balancing uh, acts uh, between consuming now or consuming and reserving some for the future, you, then you are really have, having to also uh, rely on, uh, on science. Mm -hmm. That's where I see it intersecting very clearly in the question that you just raised. And uh, for me, you know, he's, uh, commenting on the UNEP connection, mm -hmm. I spent uh, from the Stockholm side and another 30 years as a staff member of, the, uh, of UNEP directing environmental law and policy implementation. It's extremely rewarding. And hearing this now is taken up by people who are out there who have uh, found value in what we have done. The judges aspect that uh, has been uh, talked uh, to by my two colleagues earlier on. It's extremely rewarding. Mm -hmm. the, when we first put the, the symposium, first symposium 
uh, the regional symposium for Africa in 1996. We did it very cautiously because, first of all, we were not sure how judges would take it because, you know, we were not judges. I remember bringing on the board a former judge of the High Court to try to help us put a package together and do everything else. By the time of uh, 2002, we had already been convinced because we had left Nairobi and Mombasa in 1996, uh, to uh, Colombo in 1997, to Manila in 1998, uh, Mexico 2000, Caribbean 2001, and by that time when we were in Johannesburg, mm -hmm. it was quite clear. Now, it was not ours as UNEP as such. It was ours. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in reflecting the support of a community that had been ne neglected by the process of the development of multilateral law and policies over a period of time. And we took into account at that time that those who are mature like ourselves, we had studied law before there was environmental law known. Mm. So this needs okay. to fill an important gap. Thank you. One question that strikes me here is that, Lord Conworth, when you have interacted with judges from other countries, uh, Scott Fulton mentioned here, it's not really the law that's a problem, it's the implementation of the law. And, and, and I think that's uh, probably very true. But in your experience, do you think that uh, the legislative work hasn't been done in all countries? There might be still a lot of work to be done there. And can judges contribute here by informing the administration in respective countries? Yeah, I mean, I think, as Scott has said, it's not really, I mean, there, there are gaps in the law. And what has been interesting is how in certain countries the sort of judges have filled in the gaps. I mean, in a sense, that's what happened in, in India. The, it was really the lack of an adequate administrative framework that the Supreme Court found itself almost taking over in terms of enforcing adequate standards of pollution control. And then, of course, the difficulty about that is you then find them having to sort of carry on enforcing and entering, having a sort of long-term role which doesn't really fit the judges. I mean, it's very interesting, actually, the parallels between what was happening there and what was happening in, in England at the end of in the 19th century when they were trying to cope with the effects of the Industrial Revolution and pollution levels. Mm -hmm. And judges were finding themselves cast into the roles of having to give injunctions but then suspend them to give people a chance to sort of catch up with the technology. So, um, I mean, uh, inevitably there's always going to be a, a time lag between the, the laws keeping up. But I don't, I, I don't think sort of, you, I mean, UNEP can obviously help to the extent that there are model standards so when people need uh, better effective laws, they can, they can, the help can be provided. But I think the much more important thing that UNEP can do is actually to consolidate to, to help us to draw together the undoubted experience and knowledge as there is and to exchange it and this is something where the, the World Justice Project can help as well. So I think mm. that's the way one sort of should be looking mm. forward. Mm. Would there be a difference between common law lang, uh, lang countries and continental law system countries because in your system it's more judge-made law. It, is that an issue you think? Or? Not I mean one of the very interesting things about my country is we're sort of somewhere in the middle. We, you know, through the Commonwealth and the common law system we have great links with a lot of countries all around the world who've inherited a similar system. But on the other hand, as members of the uh, European community, we're having to interact with Germany, France, and indeed the European yes. Union law. And one of the encouraging things has been how actually we find that although we have different ways of doing things, in the end we are all sort of reaching similar conclusions and actually our techniques are not that different. Yes. That's an interesting observation. I've heard that in criminal law also, in comparative between common law and the continental system. Mm -hmm. Scott Fulton, um, to follow up on this, uh, the new, shall we say, design of UNEP, how do you view this? And the interesting thing that they're bringing in our judges more and more in the work of UNEP to, shall we say, enhance the, the efforts that UNEP is engaged in. What are your thinking for the future here? What is your uh, thinking for the future here? Well, the, uh the outcome um, from Rio Plus 20, the, the uh, Future We Want document, um, stood as a pretty clear expression on the part of the world community of the desire to strengthen uh, the United Nations Environment Program. That was then taken up by the, the UN General Assembly. 
um, and an important statement came out there that kind of recognized, uh, really for the first time, I think, uh, UNEP's uh, primacy within the UN family for um, environmental strategic direction. Uh, the other uh, new development is universal membership of, of UNEP, um, which changes things up to, um, to a fairly well, I think. Uh, and just uh, as a recent illustration, this uh, Governing Council decision that I mentioned, it, it has an entirely different standing um, than the statements of the Governing Council in the past, because it really does represent a worldview as opposed to a subset uh, of the world. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this develops going forward. I know there's interest um, uh, in many quarters in increasing um, budgetary support for UNEP so it can do the work we've been talking about here um, as well as, uh, as other work. Um, but of course, uh, that conversation occurs in a, a very difficult time uh, where the public resources available for this kind of work um, are constricting rather than expanding. Um, both domestically and internationally. So uh, I'm not sure um, that uh, we can uh, consider new resources as an important part of the equation. Um, what I think uh, will become important, and I hope that, uh, uh, that UNEP will see this clearly, and maybe we can help them see it, is the importance of partnership uh, in moving forward. Um, most of the things that we've talked about here today um, um, have uh, other important actors involved in them. Um, and the, the international community has generally um, done a poor job, and frankly this is a problem within domestic government as well, um, in um, taking advantage um, of the various um, possible contributions that are out there and stitching them together uh, in a way that uh, avoids duplication, um, and, and makes good use of the assets that are, that are present and available. So my hope would be that um, important new partnership relationships would develop um, where uh, UNEP uh, would be able to take this new vision, this new sense of purpose, a new degree of support, um, and uh, um, use that to draw uh, assets towards it um, that may be in the hands of other people um, in a way that is sharing and, and contributing uh, rather than um, competing. Um, but it's a, that's a challenge, uh, but I think there's an opportunity there too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Since the panelists have so scrupulously observed the time limits that we had agreed upon, we have actually half an hour now for interaction with the audience, and I think that's extremely important. But before I open the floor, was there any particular question that any panelist would like to put to some of the other panelists? Because if so, I would allow that. Otherwise, we will allow the audience. Um, then I open the floor. Is there someone here from the Secretariat? I don't see anyone present. There are two microphones here. So if somebody uh, is, is, yeah, thank you. Uh, if you could help uh, to get those microphones work by uh, whispering in them that you hear the work. There was a reference here uh, that we should recognize uh, Judge Brian Preston, who is among us. Maybe you have a comment having listened to the panel before I open the floor to the rest. I, would, I mean, I, I think I'd like to press Brian, if I may, <laughs> because, uh, in fact, I meant to mention the, the, this partnership idea. Um, I think his court and, uh, has been very proactive, in fact, in links with other countries, in particularly China. And I think it would be quite interesting to see how, to hear a little how that's developed or how it's developing. And also the partnership with yeah. uh, uh, scientists, yeah. um, because they do have in 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 well, in, in his system uh, ju uh, judges that are uh, come from the scientific community. So it will uh, also respond to your question, Han. Yeah, you're welcome, or if you want to reflect. Please take the microphone and then make the other microphone operational. And always look at me when I indicate the next speaker. Okay. Is it working? Yeah. Right. Well, thank you uh, for that. Uh, so Brian Preston from the Land Environment Court in New South Wales, Australia, uh, which is uh, the oldest superior 
a specialist in environmental court in the world, so it's over about 33 years or so now. Um, one of the things, just picking up on Lord Cardmus, which may be interesting for capacity building and in th improving the rule of law, um, I've been involved in a number of training programs uh, throughout the world and came in later on the UNEP Ad Hoc Judges Program as well. But we decided one of the best ways uh, to do the capacity building is it to actually have a twinning relationship between our court and uh, another court that's wanting to develop that capacity. And the particular court that we um, twinned with was the Supreme Court of Thailand. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a environmental division, uh, so a green chamber, uh, 13 judges. Um, and since that time, they have also spread that concept of having an environmental chamber to other uh, appellate courts uh, and uh, trial courts. Uh, interestingly, because they follow the French system, the, uh, they have a supreme administrative court as well. And uh, that court, uh, after our sort of work with the uh, Courts of Justice, the Supreme uh, Court of Thailand, also developed an environmental chamber. So they also have an environmental chamber as well. And so how the twinning relationship works is that uh, all of the judges of the Supreme Court um, Environmental Division have come out to our court and um, spent uh, weeks with us. Uh, we run training programs with them, they get to uh, sit in the cases, they get to see how uh, we do uh, matters, um, and in turn I've gone up there and others uh, to work with them on particular aspects uh, where they're needing uh, assistance, and they come up with the topics of what it is that they want us to work with them, and we spend time up there with them. And then between those uh, times, we have a sort of an open uh, channel of communication, so anything that they want, if they want some extra information or inquiries, uh, they contact us and we provide that. So we are the sort of their buddy, uh, and I think that's a very useful way of developing capacity, and it goes beyond just having a, a seminar um, because you have a sort of a friend uh, across the, uh, the sea. So that's one. The other aspect that um, uh, Justice Antonio Benjamin asked about is that, uh, in, in, Ambassador, you said uh, that the importance of science, and science is absolutely critical. Um, our court, of course, is uh, at the, the coalface of making the decisions, and then at that point, uh, you do need to have the, the science, what you don't necessarily need to if you're an appellate uh, body, because they're not doing the fact-finding. And we recognise right from the outset that the specialisation requires uh, having access to that specialist knowledge. So the court was established with not only judges, but also uh, specialist um, uh, experts. So from scientists... On the bench. On the bench. So scientists, uh, engineers, planners, uh, hydraulics uh, engineers, um, we have, because we have a few drains, we've got Aboriginal uh, people, uh, we have uh, arborists. In fact, any range of discipline you can think is relevant to any environmental problem, we have them uh, from waste and pollution and everything. Mm -hmm. The advantage of that is that, um, as the Chief Judge, I allocate cases and we look at what the, the issues are and then I match the expertise uh, to the issues and I can put multi-member panels together. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can have judges plus uh, perhaps a scientist for biodiversity issues plus a um, uh, hydraulic engineer if it's a flooding issue uh, mm -hmm. or if it's a you know, pollution issue or a waste, I can put um, specialist people who are dealing with that, I've got climate change experts and all sorts of people there. Um, so that means that we can bring that specialist decision making and I think in, in, means that we have better quality decisions, so that's an innovative way, mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, that uh, improves uh, the quality of decisions. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a value-adding uh, function. It not only leads to better quality decisions in the individual case, but the decisions also then uh, feed back and help the executive arm of government in their decision-making, because they can see how uh, principles that come out of the cases can be used in future decision-making and thereby we move 
to what uh, Scott Fulton was saying, that we move from the, the theory to the practice, we're actually starting to get the rule of law implemented, the environmental laws implemented, because they're, they're taking on board the principles that have been developed through the cases. Thank you. Thank you very much. And very interesting, this is what I recall from the Water Court of Appeal. There was an engineer among us lawyers on the bench. Who is next on this side? Uh, please, the lady, uh, uh, no, no, that's the next speaker. But the micro, sorry, the microphone goes to the lady, the uh, light hair. There, yes. That's the next speaker. You are next. And please, um, question to the panel and introduce yourself. I'm Surya Dungal, you know, I'm from Nepal. I, I, the, the, the excellent discussion that's taking place, you know, the, the, the judges and the, the actually and the practitioners, I would say, in the environmental sector. Uh, as you mentioned that, you know, the, the, the development of, you know, this environmental jurisprudence, you know, the, the role of the civil society, especially public interest lawyers, there, who brought number of cases, as you talked about India, uh, I, I remember the one single lawyer who devoted himself throughout to develop you know, environmental law, the justice, this uh, lawyer M.C. Mehta in India, and he has, you know, on his name, and if you see, go through the Google, you know, in the internet, you'll find you know, hundreds of cases in India, and the judges were impelled to make decision on cases, and that, based on that, the, the other uh, courts in other parts of the world, like uh, recently, we are uh, just before I came here, you know, I was arguing a case in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court Justice was asking, uh, can you bring some references from other countries, except India, because the number of cases being cited were from India. And we tried to look into the American cases, you know, the spotted wool case, you know, which has been actually the contribution made by uh, civil society again in there, you know, serial, serial club and other, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the organizations. And this, the, the habitat law that you're talking in the morning, you know, just the development, uh, expanding the jurisdiction uh, through the, juris the, the court jurisprudence there. So uh, we see that, uh, and the judges in this course, when the cases were being discussed at the court, then the scientific issues were raised and the judges had to really bring in from outside experts. So they had to constitute expert panel and based on the, the, the recommendations made by the experts and scientists, mm -hmm. several judgments were made. So I think the, 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 the contributions in the environmental law sector to develop the jurisprudence, uh, civil society bringing the cases to the court and really dragging the court and impelling them to link up with the scientific institutions, I think it's quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <clears throat> that was a valuable comment rather than a question. Who is next on this side? Uh, no, no, no. Yes, I know. But the microphone should be in the hand of the speaker after to win time, you see. So who, who raised the hand on this side? Okay. The, oh, that, fine. Do you have the floor now? Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the panel for their uh, very unique and wonderful insights. It's a real honor to be here. Sheila Hollis, uh, Washington, D.C. I'm here on behalf of the American Bar Association, but I'm in private practice in D.C. Uh, it would seem that the scientific relationship uh, seems to be a key element in uh, undercurrent in all the discussions. I wonder, is there an actual specific outreach to either the Royal Society in the, in the uh, UK or the National Academy of Sciences in the US or the National Academies worldwide to begin a dialogue on law and science so that uh, as brilliant as uh, judges and lawyers are, the vast amount of work and knowledge and effort that's going into the scientific studies in those arenas, if there's some way to have a formalized relational uh, uh, tie to them between law and science, it would seem like that would be a treasure trove where, in fact, wheel reinvention could be avoided. And is that, is that going on? Thank you very much for that question. Who would like to well, respond? I, I think as far as the UK is concerned, um, there's, there isn't that sort of link. I think partly because we don't, unlike the situation in New South Wales, we don't have a specialist environmental court. It's really done in a different way. We have a very well developed public inquiry system um, where the sort of judges in effect are uh, what are called inspectors, but they're effectively um, either lawyers or surveyors, but they can bring in um, scientists when they need them for particular topics rather as 
the, uh, they do in New South Wales, and they're very well developed links with the scientific community at the sort of practical level. But at my sort of level at the Supreme Court, we, uh, you know, we're not, we're, we deal, as Antonio said, we're not specialists. And there have been occasions when we've needed to bring a scientist in for something very technical, like sort of genetic engineering or something like that, but it's very rare. And um, so we, 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 we could have the links if we needed them, but I can't pretend there are any sort of formalized links, because on the whole, we don't need them. Thank you. Scott, did you want uh, to? Well, just quickly, you know, in the, uh, in the US, the, the science debate um, tends to occur at a, at a predicate stage, uh, at least when the government is involved in an environmental dispute. Uh, ordinarily, it's either in the context of an enforcement action where the government is enforcing uh, ordinarily, sometimes the law itself, but often um, uh, sub-legislation or regulation. Um, and uh, in the defensive context, um, um, it's also usually about uh, a decision by the, the administering agency um, on a technical question or a question of science. Uh, within the context of development of regulation, um, there's very active engagement with the science community, uh, including the National Academies of Science um, as part of that, not as a routine element, uh, but when there are, uh, are, are new questions of science that are not well understood, it is not at all uncommon uh, to reach out to the National Academies for that purpose. And of course, EPA has a science advisory board that can also serve that that kind of function and does peer review and other things. So what I see in the US system is the, the, the tough science questions are kind of sorted out in the regulatory development process. The regulations are almost uniformly challenged. So either the science is upheld or rejected. Um, and of course, we have rules of deference that apply in the, in the, in the review of these things where the courts are somewhat deferential uh, to the scientific judgment of, uh, of technical agencies. Uh, so when the matter comes before uh, the court or moves into the litigation sphere, um, a lot of the really tough science questions are already sorted to some degree. Um, I'm sure that's, that doesn't cover the, 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 the landscape of uh, potential science-based environmental conflicts, but that's just a, a thought and just thinking about it a little bit, Sheila. Thank you. I'm a bit of a quandary here. We have about 13 minutes left until 4 o'clock. And at 4 o'clock in the plenary hall, the working groups will report on their findings and their suggestions. So we have to respect that. Um, and Tony, well, you very quickly, yeah. uh, it, it's, it, it, it depends, this interaction between science and, and us judges, it, it depends on two factors. Uh, the first is, as Scott uh, alluded to, quite often, if it's an administrative matter that ends up being judicialized, uh, often it comes with a lot of technical expertise. And second, uh, if it's uh, a court of fact finding, then you, you probably need uh, uh, the technical expertise. But at the level of the Cour de Cassation, Conseil d'État, Supreme Court, Constitutional Courts, we are courts of, uh, uh, of legal issues. So, uh, as a general rule, we don't uh, bring those experts. Mm -hmm. And my final comment is that in most environmental cases in the green area, we don't need that level of sophistication of the expertise that is, uh, is brought in, uh, except in environment impact assessment. Okay. Thank you very much. So the lady, yes, there. Uh, Cooking Lynn from the University of Singapore, i just like to make two very short comments. When we talk about the role of judges, I think we are also thinking of the role of judges in the context of his making obicta dicta. And this is very important because we have cases from India and from Indonesia where judges uh, have said that uh, environmental law is very important and we would like to see that uh, all those who come into practice must have a course on environmental law. And uh, what was said was implemented. And so, of, of course, another example is from Singapore where the judge was administering a, a, a case 
turning on the interpretation of dumping. And uh, of course, the law was very inadequate, penalty was very low. And he said, well, I would like to law see the law change. And the law was changed, was amended to impose higher penalties. And of course, yet another case of uh, Opicta Dicta is the, by Viramentri in the uh, Capsicobo case on SD. I don't need to elaborate on that. So that's my short comment when we talk about the role, not only the judge in, actual, in, in making the actual mm -hmm. decision, but the dicta, the obicta dicta. The other very short comment is the, the role of science. Of course, it is very important. But uh, even among scientists, uh, there is controversy. So where do we draw the line? At what point of time do we, do we depend on scientists uh, as to what they say? Because they are not always in agreement. Uh, but just again to give an illustration, currently, for example, we have more typhoons, uh, earthquakes. These are considered natural disasters. But scientists have said that climate change has exacerbated the natural disasters. So in, in, in the case of, let us say, insurance, if you want to get insurance involved, insurers involved, the question of premium, uh, is it the same where a natural disaster occurs? Or what if there is an interaction of man-made disasters, man-made and natural-made disasters? I think here we might have to depend on what the scientists say, and among themselves, they may not agree, at this point of time at least. Thank you very much. Next speaker, video. And uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Eya Esif, I'm uh, the chairwoman CEO of Ecobua Group Tunisia. Uh, I just want to add uh, some of my point of view. Uh, we human beings are the center of concern for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature and specifically with forests, which are the length of our blue planet. So why would we cut down trees if we don't need to and we have an alternative? Unfortunately, civic responsibility is not really developed in many countries. That's why we have to instill it and sensitize people to their environment. We have to focus on this as a priority. It should be constitute an integral part of the development process and not be considered in isolation from it. Civic responsibility must also include the participation of the government and social and environmental project. So, my, my, uh, and our government and governments have to cooperate in a spirit of global partnership to conserve, protect, and restore the health and integrity of the Earth's ecosystem. My question is, how can we cooperate to implement a rule of law that protects our, uh, our environment for us, for our children, and the children of our children? Thank you very much. Thank you. Who would like to take the floor answering the question? Well, is uh, this the final round? Or well, we yeah, because I have about seven minutes left. Yeah. So it, it is not the final round, but there is one more question, and then the panel will. The yeah, OK. Let's have the uh, other question as well, then. So I wanted to uh, mention on the, the question that you asked about legislative work and whether it's done, and then what's the role of the judges. I think the judges can be uh, can and have been playing a leadership role, and I think we see that in the governing council uh, re resolution from UNEP. Um, but I think it's leading a larger group of legal stakeholders that includes prosecutors, regulatory lawyers, um, civil society organizations. And I think that idea of a holistic approach has a lineage that goes back at least to Johannesburg, uh, to the judges forum. Uh, so th th just a comment. And then the question I have is what can we do, including working with and through the World Justice Project, to enhance coordination and collaboration on strengthening environmental governance in countries around the world, particularly with respect to making better use of new technologies and with respect to leveraging uh, existing institutions, recognizing the resource constraints that, that Scott mentioned, leveraging existing institutional frameworks like the IUCN Commission on Environmental Law and others to advance this work. Thank you. Well, in that case, I think um, I will invite the panelists now for a final round of comments before we wind up. So thank you for your comments and your questions. Uh, should we start, uh, well, maybe uh, in the reverse order? Yep. 
Uh, a couple of thoughts. One is uh, to the gentleman from Nepal. You're absolutely correct. Uh, civil society must uh, be powerfully present in this equation. Um, I, I ticked through fairly quickly uh, this list of elements of, of good governance that need to be in place in order for there to be rule of law. Um, a few of those are clearly um, implicating of civil society. Uh, one being the uh, public access to information, another public participation, the decision-making process. I talked about accountability, <clears throat> um, but you can drill down uh, deeply into accountability, and if you do, uh, what you find is in order for there to be true accountability, uh, there has to be access to justice for civil society to hold environmental decision-makers accountable um, for, uh, for decisions that are uh, either uh, are not uh, based in science or are otherwise unprincipled. Uh, so, a um, very important point uh, <clears throat> relates to a um, point that Steve Wolfson, he didn't introduce himself, I'll introduce him, Steve Wolfson from uh, EPA, a uh, former colleague of mine, who has in his possession an article that uh, uh, Justice Benjamin and I did on these, uh, on these governance elements, yeah. translated in a number of different languages, if you'd like it. Uh, but the, the point is, we, we're, this is a panel of judges. We're, uh, we're kind of judge-centric in what we're talking about. But plainly, um, these elements that we've described for you um, have implications for lots of different stakeholder groups and participants in the process. And I just want to reemphasize um, the, the interdependence of these elements. They really all need to be the points of focus. And then in terms of how... Um, uh, the World Justice Project can su be supportive of work in this area. Um, I, I, there are a couple of uh, things that there's in the sweet spot of the, of the WJP's work that are, are relevant and useful. One is the incubation process, and, um, and uh, that may serve as a place where some environmental projects can be, environmental law, rule of law projects can be brought forward that can catalyze um, uh, a broader movement on this front. And the other is the indexing, which I talked about before. If the, it's already should be quite useful to the United Nations Environment Program in its current form, uh, but to the extent um, that there's an effort by the project to refine the metrics relating to environmental rule of law, all the more useful uh, in both guiding activity and then measuring the, the efficacy of that activity. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Lord Conroth. Yes, well, perhaps two points. I, I mean, the last questions, in a way, ask the, the fundamental question of how can we actually improve all this? Um, and I don't think we have any easy answers. I think one point was made by the gentleman from Nepal is that the NGOs are crucial in this. People like Mr. Mehta, who brought these cases. But they're all, all over the world, one's seen how very determined activists have been able to bring cases. You need the people to bring the cases, and you need the responsive judges. And where that happens, you can achieve uh, a great deal. The other thing I think, which I think UNEP could do, is to look back. I think it's quite important not to be reinventing the wheel. I think it's actually quite important to realize, and this is what I was trying to emphasize, that quite a lot has been achieved. And I think it'd be terribly useful if UNEP were to look back and say, well, what have we achieved? What are the things that have gone right since 2002? Where have we been able to make advantages? How can we build on those? Because I think if we look at our past achievements, we're more likely not to make, well, we look at our past achievements and our failures, we're likely to, to develop the successes and not make the same mistakes in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. A couple of points. Uh, one on the UNEP side, the entry point, I think, is uh, their uh, half Montevideo program for the fourth decade, because they are about to begin its own review five years after that is between now and 10, 15. And so if the World Justice Project were to enter this particular review period, it would give them an entry point in reaffirming the directions of the balance of the five years thereafter. And I think it would be quite timely. I think it's very important. Attaching, attaching itself to that, it could also pick a country or a country per region where in the field of the environment, governance, and rule of law, and really try to uh, work with that as an example 
of what could be done. And the index has certain indicators in the number of those countries that it has done. So that, I think, would, is a, would be a very useful entry point. The second point, uh, Chair, is uh, uh, I heard the lady here and the others say the judges sh should play a, a leading role. In, in Kenya, uh, in Kenya they, they have authority to do precisely that. If you look at Kenyan constitution, uh, 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 Article uh, 259.1, it says this constitution shall be interpreted in a manner that A, promotes its purposes, values, and principles, B, advances the rule of law under human rights and the fundamental freedoms in the Bill of Rights, C, permits the development of the law, they have no excuse whatsoever to say that is for parliament. No, it permits the development of the law and D, contributes to good governance. And the issue of human rights, which we have not addressed here, but uh, there is a tie between human rights and environmental rights. The Constitution in uh, uh, Section 22B uh, has, has the following, once again, the judges have absolutely no excuse. In, apl in applying a provision of the Bill of Rights, a court shall, that's a court, that's including my tribunal, must do something more. Develop the law to the extent that it does not give effect to a right or fundamental freedom. So, at least from the Kenyan side, there's absolutely no excuse on the part of the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, High Court, and these other superior courts of record. And even on a small uh, institution such as mine, which plugs in uh, the, the whole structure, because if justice is not uh, uh, close to the people, then whose justice is it? Even to that level, we have authority I have authority as chairman to call an expert, a scientist, uh, whoever, and I have two scientists on the tribunal. I had a biologist and a climatologist. So it's open. I think the challenge is for us, for you, to move these institutions in the direction that you feel they have been lacking. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that defense for your constitution. I'm sure that I will make sure that uh, Justice, Chief Justice Willy Mutunga gets the message that you delivered here. Also. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Antonio Benjamin, last in the panel. Steve alluded to the fact that we need to, uh, to bring the judges in order to close the compliance and enforcement circle. So it's important that in doing this, we don't forget that uh, it is a circle, so we we need to uh, to take good care of all those actors, uh, because otherwise, at the end of the day, uh, judges will not be able to uh, to deliver. We also should keep in mind that when we say the role of judges in protecting the environment is uh, the, the whole expression is uh, an oversimplification, because. Uh, there are judges and judges. I mean, there are so many different models of judiciary around the world. Take, for example, uh, the, uh, the, the case of India, Pakistan, and, uh, and ba Bangladesh. Judges there have suomoto jurisdiction. So they wake up early in the morning, get a newspaper, uh, a tea, and see uh, the judge sees something that he or she doesn't like very much and arrives at the office and starts an investigation or, um, 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 or a file uh, on that. In most part of the world, that's not the way uh, it works. It also applies to the question of Professor Ko Kang Liang in respect to um, uh, uh, opta dicta. Uh, we, uh, this is very uh, common in the United States and uh, including my own, even when we don't say that it's uh, an orbital dictum. Uh, but in other parts of the world, that's not the, the, uh, the way that, it's, um, that justice is, uh, is delivered. My very last comment is that um, we uh, should not uh, be disencouraged 
by uh, looking around and not seeing the amount of jurisprudence, of case law, uh, of specialized courts that we see in many parts of the world. Uh, we just should look back and, yeah, and remember that 10 years ago, uh, we would not be having uh, uh, a discussion like this on the role uh, of the judiciary. So this in itself is reason to celebrate, and I do hope that we will be celebrating uh, for many, many years. Thank you very much. This brings us to the close of this uh, panel. Uh, I think we're all grateful to our four panelists who, from their different uh, perspectives uh, and also based on uh, their experience, have shared their wisdom with us. Uh, when you look at uh, the environment and the globe, I think you do that uh, with uh, uh, a certain humility. And I discovered that with um, the older you get, the more you start looking at the environment, and in particular when you look at old trees, because then you can compare the tree to your own age. And uh, to me, the tree, the old tree, has become uh, like a mentor. I had the privilege of chairing a major Nordic Council conference up in Ilulisat in Greenland in 2008. And there I witnessed the enormous Ilulisat glacier charging down in the sea, kilometers of towering ice. The speed of this glacier in the summer now is 50 meters per day. So we are actually sort of making a contribution to the natural circle that the globe describes with respect to climate and environment. But we should be careful not to hurry this process the way we do. This is an ethical question also. How much CO2 do we consume per capita? Look at the World Bank's index here, and that gives you something to think about. And also, as Kofi Annan often quotes, an African saying that the, the world, the globe, the environment is something that we hold in trust for coming generations. And here we all have to play our roles depending on in which part of society we are active. And certainly judges have to play their part, a very important part. I thank you all for attending this panel. Thank you the panelists with a big hand and let's go down in the plenary hall. <laughs>